Welcome, everybody, to episode 99 of Radicalized Truth Survives podcast. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda, and today High Fidelity and I are going to be interviewing Adam Sibera. He is an analyst and a journalist, and he has been in Ukraine for the last couple of years documenting war crimes and also informing us in TED Talks about the mental invasion. Take a look at some of his work. Sabera, we are so grateful that you are here with us today and uh, so appreciative of everyone who is actually doing the work from Ukraine, boots on the ground. And what can you tell us about that video that we just saw? Well, uh, that's a video from an epicenter, which is like a Home Depot uh, that was attacked by a guided missile, two of them actually uh last weekend i think or it's a week to 10 days i'm uh, not sure the exact date right now no actually it was on a saturday it was definitely on a saturday because we were talking about how um they specifically attacked it on saturday because that has the most uh civilians who would uh go in there to do their shopping and it's uh a Russian tactic used to basically destroy everyday life and uh, sort of uh, make you feel in danger everywhere you go. You never feel safe. And uh, after spending, you know, two, not exactly in Kharkiv, but two years in Ukraine, you can feel it that uh, it sometimes, you know, your mind plays with you. And uh, if there's bombs and rockets flying into the city, into the civilian areas, like I notice on myself that uh, when I'm um, too long in an in a populated place or where people tend to gather, yeah, uh, you don't feel too well. Yeah, I understand. I understand. And so um, you're in the dark right now. Can you explain to our viewers uh, why that is? Well, uh, it's a blackout. And uh, I'm not sure if it's coordinated or uh, caused by an explosion into the energy and infrastructure, but basically same with the home depot it's uh, another tactic of um, the russian military uh, how to destroy uh, like or how to make life as most uh, m as uncomfortable as uh, you possibly can like uh, you see that we're improvising here everything's running on power banks hopefully like the mobile internet keeps on working and you know that's it if you uh, if you're um, like you know, people live their lives every day. Uh, they go to work. They try to live to as much as they can. And these are just like everyday hurdles they have to overcome. And obviously, you know, if uh, like me, I'm a, I'm a guy in uh, my early 30s who's doing my work here. And I'm sort of, you know, uh, in somewhat a mental space uh, to go through it. But if you, you know, elderly, if uh, your family with kids, it makes living uh, here very difficult. I understand. Listen, I just want to thank you so much for the work that you do and the bravery. And I know often when I say that to folks that we interview in Ukraine, they they don't want to hear it. They're like, it's the people here who are brave. I volunteer to be here. But I I have to say that because my um, all of the work we do is informed by people like you who are actually there. And I'm very, very, very grateful. And what is what is in you? Uh, being from uh, uh, Czech Republic, correct? What is in yes. you that made you want to take on this work of basically documenting Russian war crimes in Ukraine? Uh, well, I've been, um, I'm work as an analyst slash correspondent. There's more uh, companies or organizations that I'm, I have been involved here uh, since the beginning of war. But prior to the war, uh, I was an analyst in this program of uh, European Valley Security Center called Kremlin Watch, where we we're monitoring Russian propaganda and influence in Central Europe. And obviously, once the full scale invasion started, um, like I have a lot of friends in Ukraine. I have a lot of sentimental value because I used to play football as well. And uh, first big tournament we won was in Kyiv when I was like 14 or 13. So ever since I have um, like positive feelings to the country. 
And once the Filska invasion started, obviously with my uh, emotional connection to the country, as well as uh, the profession I was doing, I I didn't feel it was right to sit at home. Well, I'm again grateful, and I obviously we're going to talk about this kinetic war. But you did a very brilliant TED talk where Thank you, you talked about the mental invasion. And you gave me the gift of those two words, and I'm gonna be using them a lot because obviously you're seeing the destruction and the bombs being dropped and the, and, the, and the legitimate terror and loss of lives. But before any of that and during all of that is this mental invasion. We endure it here in America. It's still invisible to too many people, but can you please inform our viewers about that? Mental invasion is a concept I came up with uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Poiman, who's a criminologist, and he's been uh, studying uh, deviant behavior of the Russian army and uh, war crimes they've been committing here since 2014. He's been on the ground since 2014, and uh, he was evacuated from Donetsk when I was evacuated from Kiev. He's a person who really knows what's happening. And we've came up the, with this concept, basically, how... Um, not just conventional warfare, but also the kinetic and uh, how the effects on it has on its uh, on people's mind is essentially um, crucial part of the Russian. Um, how would I say uh, their their um, uh, how how they strategy how they want to control strategy how they want to control people how yeah. they want to subdue people. And, uh, you know, like, uh, the longer this goes on, it becomes more difficult and they know it. And, uh, with quite, with like complete, being completely frank, um, Russian people and, uh, Russian country is in a condition where they're uh, used to struggling. Ukraine is essentially a European country and, uh, they're, uh, they're used to some sort of a comf uh, so some sort of comfort and how they evaluate it is, is if we deprive them of this comfort. And uh, we take, you know, we we uh, invade your mind with all this destruction and pain. Eventually, they will give up. But uh, obviously, what Ukraine has been proving is that's not the case. And they're ready to protect their freedom. They will be doing so. I can confirm this. I'm not, uh, I'm in, and I'm in Kharkiv. I'm in 25 kilometers from the front line right now. And I don't run into people who uh, who are prepared to give up. It, it's just I'm 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 astonished because you're basically able to put words to everything that we have been documenting and experiencing here in America. And we know that uh, Putin and the Kremlin invaded the minds of Russians when he came into power at that time on the Internet in Russia. People were very like excited about freedom and democracy. And uh, it was very much like, you know, uh, very, very much a pro-democracy attitude. Putin comes online, pushes everybody toward totalitarianism and never stopped. And so everything that is happening that he's doing in the West and doing in Ukraine and doing in Baltic states, he did do his own people first. And yes. I think that is uh, I think that is part of this great sickness and why our mm -hmm. friend Paul Nyland refers to uh, Russia as a death cult now. Exactly. And yes. Yes. Can you speak a bit on that? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, I don't view Putin as a politician. He's a person who grew up in the KGB circles. He was thought to be a KGB spy, which is different than a regular spy. It's uh, people without a backbone who use, uh, I mean, they're trained to use uh, whatever means necessary to achieve their goals. And the thing about Russia is that Ever since uh, Stalin, uh, uh, it's uh, he essentially incorporated the criminal structure into the state. It's uh, not that you know uh, there's mafia and there's the state. It's essentially intertwined. I like uh, calling uh, today's Kremlin a kleptocratic syndicate rather than a, uh, rather than a political uh, or ideological system. And uh, I think, you know, uh, Putin, uh, he's a power hungry, uh, essentially like the main oligarch who uh, in the first place, he went after power and money. And uh, once that is, uh, was gone in Russia, uh, he has to expand and he has to explain to his people why they don't have money and why he's expanding. So essentially once he, he his, the resources there were all controlled and stolen and there's nothing more to steal. I'm simplifying right now, but you know, 
um, um, he expanded he, to other countries and Ukraine's not the first one. This happened to Georgia before, this happened wow. in Chechnya. And uh, I mean, wow. yes, there's this sort of like imperialism thing, but in my opinion, uh, I think imperialism is the story uh, he, he says, but above all of this is the power and the money. He's essentially yeah. like an ultimate mafia guy, you know? He's he's a thief. Yes. He's a, yes. He's a uh, gluttonous thief. I'm going to say that again. Three. And a murderer. Two, yeah. Three, two, two. He's a thief. He's a gluttonous thief. And yes, uh, a war criminal murderer. And you are there documenting these war crimes. And um, I got one more question and then hi fi jump in. I just want to know. Because we have been talking to many people who've been documenting the, you know, onslaught of war crimes that are occurring in Ukraine. Um, I want to know how you're handling this mentally. You have an incredibly good grasp on what's going on, but how are you able to emotionally cope with all of the destruction and the horrors that you've had to witness? Well, I, I get inspired by Ukrainians. If they're capable of doing it, why wouldn't I be? But uh, honestly, sometimes it is challenging. Like, um, I wouldn't even say like the most graphic things person saw, but like just the general picture of it, how, uh, you know, for a greed of, uh, and I don't want to say one man because it is a system. Uh, I'm afraid Russia is in a position that even if Putin was replaced, someone worse may uh, came, uh, come, come along. Uh, I don't think they're uh, going to, go through a democratic transformation or for, for something better anytime soon. But uh, because of this system, what uh, destruction of a beautiful country with uh, sincere aspiration for uh, to become part of Europe and uh, become part of our Western world. And even like I can confirm even uh, the mentality here is European. And uh, because of uh, what uh, this kleptocratic syndicate from Kremlin uh, led by uh, this bloodthirsty criminal Putin and a thief, uh, what destruction on uh, lives of people who are completely innocent in this he brings. Uh, yes, it, it, it is sad. And uh, you, you think about the world and uh, what kind of justice we have to live through. But I mean, that's what motivates you to overcome it and, uh, you know, not, not give in to the evil. Wow. High five. So uh, I'm going to correct something, uh, a word I offered you earlier. I, I offered the word strategy. Uh, I would like to change that. I think what we are seeing Putin engage in is a criminal methodology in which he first tries to break the minds of his opponents through propaganda and operations. Yes. Uh, and then he attempts to take the lives of his opponents through warfare. Uh, we're seeing the same operations running in Georgia with the Tatushki beating the political opposition. Uh, we saw that happen, uh, you know, in Ukraine with the fall of Yanukovych. Uh, we've seen this happen. They've tried running operations in Moldova. Uh, they've mm -hmm. tried running operations against Estonia. Uh, all of Eastern Europe gets it. They're like, Russia is a problem. And yet... Um, I only see recently that NATO and the West, the United States are starting to take this seriously. Um, have things, has the tide changed since the United okay. States passed the aid package and Biden uh, you know, agreed to allow Ukraine to use weapons to hit inside Russia? Have things changed since then? I'm glad you bring that up because uh, I mean, I'm always skeptical of um, evaluating things that just happened because uh, war is a long-term thing. And uh, I, I like evaluating trends more than uh, decisions and, and their immediate effect. But I can say that, or I can confirm from uh, people who are fighting and uh, from uh, my acquaintances there, that there has been a, quite a significant weapon fired at a S-300 or S-400 rocket system near the Belhorod Oblast or in Belhorod Oblast near the Belhorod city, which is uh, where uh, Russia launches most of its attacks towards Kharkiv. And there were sirens today or air raids, air, I mean air alerts, but uh, to Kharkiv standard, not as many explosions heard. 
So, so it definitely had an effect. And this is like a um, concrete and uh, real example of how these fear of escalations uh, are uh, essentially a political game. Um, Putin has been saying that everything is an escalation ever since the beginning. If I remember correctly, just sending weapons on the beginning was an escalation. Uh, and uh, he started doing the nuclear threats. And um, I mean, the nuclear threats, they're never, you know, they never should be taken lightly. But at the same time, uh, I think if we come back to uh, Putin's initial motivation, and that is money and the power. And mm -hmm. I think he very well knows that once he touches the red button, it will be over for him. And uh, I still, I still, uh, I still think he's the kind of criminal that he wants to play it to the last card. And yes. uh, he really doesn't want to die and he really wants to keep his money. Yes, and also they've laundered all that money in the West. So there goes yes. all of their mansions and their yachts and, and their you know mistresses and their mistresses' children and you know, so on and yes. on. I just I, I want to get your reaction to something because I'm still sort of in a bit of semi-shock about it. We just interviewed a reporter who got access to military contractor Eric Prince's WhatsApp group chat of hundreds and hundreds of, he said the scale was extreme right all the way to fascism. And one of the things that he said, which was very fucking disturbing, is that they were gushing over Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin. This group was gushing, uh, according to the reporter Ken Silverstein. Mike Flynn was gushing, saying this was the most important piece of journalism, you know, in in decades or something to that effect. When you hear that, what does that tell you? Being in Ukraine, seeing how this criminal is operating. Well, I mean, uh, there's the saying here that whatever is going on in Russia, like uh, we see what Russia is doing here, you know, let them let them eat, eat each other alive. But back to Tucker Carlson. Uh, yes, I mean, for them, how I see it uh, in their Kremlin mentality, that was a great victory because it's exactly, you know, uh, we all know that uh, a lie uh, once you once you so seek like once you put it into the information space, it will be there. And especially with like development of digital technology and, and communication technology that we're using right now, and it will keep on, you know, living its own life. And uh, for them having Tucker Carlson, you know, be their uh, essentially amplifier, it was a big victory. And uh, obviously they were laughing about it. And uh, Tucker Carlson buried himself in history as a, as a, as a joke of a journalist. Thank you very much. And what do you think about the people in Congress and people like Trump's former national security advisor applauding this interview. Well, uh, I, I don't see into uh, the heads of any one of them, but how I see it, there's essentially three types of, I mean, uh, in uh, Ukraine, we call them Zhduni, which is people who work uh, purposefully uh, for the Russian side as either collaborators or useful idiots. But there's people who are motivated by money. Yeah. Uh, there's people who are motivated by compromise. And then there's people who just want to see the world burn. Uh, usually, you know, uh, with some historic trauma, which can even be horrible, but and they never got justice for it. So now they just want to like uh, everyone yeah. else to experience that as well. Wow. I, I would remind our viewers that uh, during the, the Rwandan genocide, uh, there were propagandists who were, found guilty of enabling genocide and uh, charges were brought against them. And personally, I hope the same thing happens to Tucker Carlson because mm -hmm. by enabling Putin, he is enabling war crimes. Yes. I mean, I think that's one of the best ways to fight disinformation and propaganda. And um, I think uh, it's a shame that EU and NATO are not cooperating on this uh, consistently together because it's a global issue and other Western or international partners that are being attacked by propaganda and disinformation and uh, how there's not enough done to um, uh, get, you know, to establish liability and uh, to hold people accountable. 
because freedom of speech is not saying freedom of whatever you want and insulting whatever you want and uh, bringing out all these horrible lies and essentially, you know, smearing an entire ethnic uh, group and a free nation with the most horrible insults uh, you can do. I mean, uh, you, if you look at big conglomerates in how many in into uh, in uh, how many trials they go into just because someone you know took a picture of them on a beach, like uh, you know, why are we not doing this to anyone? Uh, essentially, uh, it's it's defamatory, de defamatory, right? Yes. And, uh, we we have a we have an entire legal structure and how to punish these offenses. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, we bring out this freedom of speech card, and and uh, it, it's it, it's a paradox, but that's what's drive driving freedom of speech into shit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I do have some good news for you. Uh, there is an American propagandist who goes by the name of Scott Ritter. Uh, he has a appeared. Uh, on RT, he has condemned Ukraine. He has spread lies about Ukrainian Nazis. Uh, he was on his way to St. Petersburg recently and was removed from the plane and his passport was taken. And supposedly this was on the orders of the State Department. So perhaps there is some movement. Uh, well, uh, he, he's also a convicted pedophile. And, you know, that is always the word they throw out when they're trying to smear anybody who's pro-democracy, but it's uh, often projection. And in his case, there's even a conviction. What I would like to bring up, um, a couple of things you said so important when we interviewed our friend Paul Nyland, who's based in, in uh, Kiev, and he is an investigative reporter who also founded um, Ukraine's uh, suicide hotline, Lifeline Ukraine. He said that he doesn't understand why we are not just shunning these people, shunning these propagandists. Yes, I want to see some Nuremberg type trials, but in the meantime, they should be literally shunned uh, into, uh, you know, oblivion by those who understand just how dangerous they are. But I want to say something that I just learned recently when I was revisiting Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny, because that is a book that I think everybody needs to read over and over and over again. Yes. But but what I really understood finally for the first time is to understand why the wealthy and the powerful support a criminal, a rapey criminal like Trump. It's because they believe he will funnel the country's spoils to them should he return to power. So yes, there's ego and there's compromise and there's ideology and all of that. But at the end of the day, there's just greed. And when you mention Putin having already greedily taken the wealth from Russia and then greedily having to move into other countries to steal their wealth, I feel like there are, you know, when we talk about how many more countries have been moving from democracy to authoritarianism, I feel like there's just this unbridled greed that has not yet been stopped. And I think mm -hmm. when you're documenting war crimes, what you're really seeing is that 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 horrible greed and power by any means necessary. And I don't know if you have a thought on that. I don't even know if it's a question. Well, the, the people who do the war crimes are usually, you know, ordinary soldiers. And uh, I'm not saying it's uh, a mistake of one soldier. I mean, it's a Russian systemic tactic for generations, how to inflict fear and how to inflict pain. But mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's driven by uh, by greed. I think that's driven by uh, that. This is essentially the result of the hateful propaganda. Uh, the greed comes from the top and uh, they very well know that if they have these foot soldiers who are willing to do anything, including, you know, uh, torturing people, raping mm -hmm. children, uh, killing, you know, l like flattening uh, small cities and villages and anything they can reach, burning them out to the ground. Uh, they know they have a force that people will be afraid of. It's again, we come back to the to the criminal mentality and methodology. It's uh, essentially uh, fear is the 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 factor that runs it, and uh, but uh, coming coming back to greed, uh, Russia and their oligarchs are uh, using our system on uh, how to how to launder money. They keep money in our banks, and this is I think a crucial problem because our politicians unfortunately keep the money in similar banks and they will never go against their money because once this uh, house of cards start falling 
they uh, they will become uh, impacted by it as well. And uh, this is like the problem we have to deal with. And uh, it will take like um, confidence and uh, and um, how would I say uh, determination to, you know, to take hits, which uh, I mean, it, it went so far that taking this system apart will cost us. But, you know, it's something we have to do. It's like it's uh, we made a mistake in uh, trusting Russia in the 90s and in the zero years we've started making money with them and now you know uh we we're uh we're um what do you call it uh like uh you're, what what you you're sowing what you uh or you know that, reap that, what you and, sow yeah, yeah that's it that's it exactly Dude. and un until we realize this uh we will keep on funding this uh war machine it's uh quite visible in Central Europe, where I come from, where essentially the rhetoric is all correct, it's all pro-Ukrainian, it's uh, very anti-Russian, but then, you know, we keep on buying gas and oil from them, and just the amount from Czech Republic, which is a small country in Central of Europe, can keep uh, running the PMC Wagner Group, you know, somewhere in Africa, or even now incorporated into the Russian army for a couple of months a year. And uh, that's another, you know... Um, a thing Ukraine uh, Ukrainian army has to deal with. And it's essentially, you know, if uh, we give all these weapons to Ukraine, but at the same time, we give a similar amount, or if not more or more or less, whatever, to Russia, you know, it's a uh, it's a zero. It's it, it's a it's a equal fight. And um, how do we get out of this? It's also why the war is uh, taking so long. If uh, we have if sanctions have worked and we have truly stepped on uh, the economic arteries of the Russia's war machine properly, uh, Ukraine has complete power to stop them. You know, it's like this this narrative that Russia is unbeatable. I think Ukraine has been proving over 800 days that they're very much beatable. Yeah. It's just uh, the reality that they're a smaller country with a smaller army, so it's difficult. But I mean, the initial plan was to take Kyiv in five days. Uh, the, count, the, the offensive on Kharkiv started almost a month ago. And they've lost so much armored vehicles and so much infantry in it. And they yeah. haven't made basically any progress. I mean, uh, it did, I, to an extent, give them initiative on the Eastern Front because it's tied up a lot of the forces in uh, uh, up north of Kharkiv. But you see that, you know, that military is not unbeatable. The essential no. strategy they have is the fear and yeah. overwhelming everyone with how much life they are willing to sacrifice to gain, you know, uh, basically insignificant territorial grounds. And they're counting on uh, that our will at one point will run out. But if it doesn't, they will lose. I just, you know, I want to applaud because that was just incredibly brilliant. I'm going to go back to greed for one more second because you said something fucking brilliant. You said, we got to admit we made a mistake in the 90s when we trusted Russia. Because that's really what it is. That's that's what gave us London grad. That's yeah. why well, that's why we had Trump. It's all of that. It's it's Trump selling his condos uh, anonymously to the oligarchs. It's all yes. of the Russian money that was pumped into the UK. It's all the world of offshoring. It's all the lawyers and accountants who profited off this fucking mafia state. That's exactly what it is. And you're so right. He has bled the country dry. And in dictatorships, you don't have uh, soldiers on the ground with what they need, truly. It's like they, they we see all the videos from Russian soldiers in the last few years saying that they don't have what they need. And quite frankly, Prigozhin, you know, who was shot out of the sky, was, you know, doing his own videos saying we don't have ammunition. So you just nailed that point um, completely. And America, if you're listening, you know, do we want a future? Do we want a future? I mean, we're, we're in America yeah. right now looking at the fact that we might be facing our last election ever. That's real. Countries that go from democracies to authoritarianism don't know when it's their last election. We in America actually know this could be our last election. And I mean, what can what can you, I mean, this interview was already so amazing, but what can you tell our global viewers and particularly our viewers in America about 
why everybody needs to get behind Ukraine now? Well, um, already now, uh, with everything that has happened, the world world won't be the same for a couple of years ahead, maybe a decade, maybe 15 years. I mean, things change, you know, it's hills and valleys, it goes up and down. But if Ukraine doesn't win this war, it will be the it will it will be much worse for all of us. Not even talking about the people uh, involved, because uh, I mean we already are on uh, all kinds of Russian lists. But if we, you know, if we lose our will and our protection, and uh, you know we subdue uh, ourselves to them, they will change the world to their liking, and. Uh, like we see Putin, you know, raising the skeletons of Stalinism and uh, Stalin killed over 20 or even 40 million people. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm too late for me to give the right number, but it's, you know, no, it's nobody million. knows. Nobody knows how many. <laughs> but the fact that he has tried to whitewash uh, Stalin's, you know, uh, absolutely psychopathic history is um and you know. to this day, we'll, we're dealing with those traumas and he will open up the wounds again and, uh, you know, create that story over again if he's successful. So it's absolutely imperative to not let that happen. And uh, one more thing, when we were talking about uh, Russia in the 90s, uh, yes, the naivety. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I was only only just born in the 90s. But uh, like looking back at it, I mean, uh, if you look how uh, Nazi Germany was drilled with propaganda, and how parents even were willing to, you know, put their kids up into the front line in the last days of war, how brainwashed they were and what it took to get Germany out of that state of mind. It was essentially 40 years of occupation and uh, thinking that Russia, after all of their experience with communism and this uh, horrible, um, murderous, kleptocratic regime they had, that uh, suddenly, you know, we changed the uh, we changed the stamps, and <laughs> they're going to become uh, better and like democratic. It was completely naive, and uh, now we're um, now this is the result of it. I just, um, I, you know, I want to end on two things. Um, we're gonna we're gonna end this episode with a clip from your TED talk because it's really important about mental invasion. I need people to hear it, understand it bear witness to it. But I also want to show the photo um, that you sent us that shows this beautiful apartment building with these beautiful homes and their beautiful wallpaper and the entire front uh, mm. bombed off. And can you just, can you just tell our viewers just how fucking real something like that is how this isn't something that just happens you know someplace yeah. else far away that this is everyone's fucking war look at that so this is a picture from northern saltivka which is uh, essentially the um northern part of kharkiv and uh, it was what i would say uh what russian propagandists and you know um basically cannibalizing the narrative that uh it's a russian uh, it, it's a russian speaking part of town that they will be welcoming the russian troops and when they didn't because if you ask anyone in saltivka is like yes yeah, so what we speak russian we're close to the border this is how the you know the world turned out but we didn't ask anyone to come liberate us from anything there hasn't been any discrimination and once they approached with tanks which uh, what they thought would be a smooth victory they were welcomed not with flowers but with Molotov cocktails, and uh, this was uh, this was one of the um, reactions from the. This is the deviancy of a uh, Russian army. If you don't do what we want, we will destroy everything you have. And when they were sieging uh, Kharkiv, essentially, and this is I'm glad you brought this out because one of uh, the most uh, or some somewhat my proudest moments in Ukraine so far is that I had the ple pleasure to work with uh, Maidan Monitoring Information Center and Petr Poyman's team for Ukraine on documenting these horrible war crimes. And it led to um, indictment of General Andrei Ruzinski, who was the commander of, um, I, I won't remember the, uh, the battalion right now, apologies, but you can, you can look him up. I think it was 11th Corps of the Baltic Fleet, if I'm not mistaken. 
But he essentially gave the order to breach the sovereign border of Ukraine. And once the capitulation of Kharkiv didn't work out and uh, they had to siege the cities, uh, the city with a battle, they started bombing the shit out of these residential areas. They used uh, air bombs. They used rocket systems like Uragan, Smedge. They used uh, fire systems. Uh, they killed uh, civilians who they ran into. And again, coming back to uh, the fear implementation, if uh, you don't do what we want, we will destroy everything you have. And again, it's incredible uh, to see Ukrainians uh, being so resilient. And even after that, even to today, and this is the how how uh, Ukraine, how Zosu, Zosu is uh, armed forces of Ukraine, how they managed to, even after two years of withstanding this, is to block another offensive on Kharkiv. It just shows how incredibly resilient people they are and how they're not willing to give up their freedom. And uh, sometimes uh, I, I don't want to say I feel shame, but I'm disappointed if uh, West observing this and still deliberating whether we can fire into Russian territories and still, you know, leading all these political debates, whether this won't lead to escalation. Putin already did all the escalation. There's nowhere yeah. more to escalate to. If, uh, if he's, and again, we'll come back to the nuclear threats. If he's going to push the button, it's the end of him. And he can do it even without the escalation. He has the power to. He's it's a bluff, you know. And even even if he does it, there's nothing anyone can do about it. He already has the nuclear weapons. So there's no reason to be afraid of him. NATO, together, we can wipe Ukraine. I mean, sorry, Russia. No, count 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 yourself back in, starting with NATO and Ukraine. Three, two. NATO and us together, we can wipe Russian uh, military out of the planet Earth if we choose to. They, there is, uh, uh, it's sometimes like uh, unbelievable how uh, we're still, I mean, it's uh, over 800 days, over 820 days into a full scale war, the worst war that has been in Europe since World War II. And we're asking ourselves if we will allow Ukraine to fire on Russian rocket systems that are targeting civilian areas that are committing war crimes. It's, you know, I don't, I don't want to go too far into it, but to an extent, you can argue you're also helping that, you know, you're allowing yes. it because you, we have the power to stop it. You, you diagnosed it already. All the talk, all the chatter, whatever sanctions, all of it is masking the fact that Western nations are not willing to say they made a goddamn mistake in the 90s. And that's really what it is. And, and because of the tentacles and the networks of that financial octopus monster, uh, that is what puts Ukraine uh, in the situation that it's in. And I hope that there is the will and the guts uh, of Western leaders just to say, okay, we made a fucking mistake, we're gonna make it right. And to make it right, we gotta uh, make sure Ukraine beats Russia. Cause you're right, yes. it's it's not even a world that uh, it, anybody wants to live in. We fight here, the information war, cause we don't want our children and grandchildren being uh, raised in a fascist hellscape. And, uh, and I think that, you know, What's happening right now is just so incredibly uh, vitally important and vitally important that everybody yeah. understands it. And um, all I want to say is that uh, I wish that you weren't there, um, but I'm really grateful that you are. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invite. And uh, on what you were saying, maybe on the last note, uh, Ukraine has the knowledge and the will to beat Russia. Uh, they just need the weapons and uh, they need our help. And if we give it to them, it will all, all end well. Adam Sibera, thank you so very much for being with us here today. Uh, so grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. You guys are great. My name is Adam Sibera. I'm from the Czech Republic. My background is in international protection of human rights. And currently, I participate in Team for Ukraine on information analysis and war crime documentation. Yesterday, I arrived from Kharkiv, and today, I would like to speak to you about this job, about propaganda, and about something I call the mental invasion. Information, access to it, and its dissemination has always been a powerful tool of social coercion. Social media 
and the rise and development in artificial intelligence has made meddling with perception of reality easier than ever.